All right, it's now 10 o'clock, and I'm so grateful that you've joined us. I'm Suzanne Stoltenberg with NFIB Pennsylvania. We are presenting everything you need to know about employee retirement plans for small business. Now, I apologize. You may notice on that first slide some of the letters are cut off at the bottom, but we have noticed that that's not really causing a problem very much at all through the presentation. So if you do have any questions, feel free to type them in, and we'll answer them. It's rather a long presentation, but we're going to get it done in about a half an hour. You can also email me questions and I will get them answered by our uh, HR McNeese, Wallace, and Nurek, the law firm, California Manufacturers Association, and members first. And now I'm going to throw it to Mike Fedash, who is our presenter. Mike, thank you so much. He um, is going to take it from here and let you know a little bit about himself and also all this information that he has uh, and his expertise in the field. Mike, take it away. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Again, my name is Michael Fedash, and I'm an investment consultant with Members First Investment Services. I specialize uh, in business owners and their employees, um, put together plans that work to help them uh, retain employees, save for retirement. I was in corporate finance previous to, uh, to my, uh, my move into wealth management, uh, and at that point, uh, about focusing uh, very heavily in this uh, regard uh, because it was something that I had a lot of exposure to in my previous role. Um, so today what we are going to talk about are retirement plans for small businesses. Um, you know, we're, we're going to touch on a lot of topics, but uh, what you're going to find is there's, there's a lot of different vehicles out there, and not all of them are the same. Uh, some have, um, you know, more opportunities or less opportunities, but there's there's very much give and take with the different kind of plans that we're going to talk about. And we're, we're going to go through those and, you know, hopefully through this presentation you're able to find uh, something that might fit for your, uh, for your company. Uh, you might find that there's something that's better out there than what you're currently doing. So hopefully with those things you end up finding, uh, finding some things that add value for you. Um, from a disclosure standpoint, everything obviously, as you see there, anything we talk about is not uh, NCOA guaranteed or insured. Um, you know, the, the uh, things we talk about can lose value, um, and, uh, you know, obviously this with the disclosure of, you know, it's a mandatory thing that you just understand these things that we're talking about are securities related, not bank or credit union related. So when it comes down to, uh, to it, there are factors that you want to consider uh, when looking at either implementing or changing the type of retirement plan that you have. Um, you know, one specific thing, you're the business entity that you have, you know, what what are you structured as? Uh, are you an S-Corp, C-Corp, an LLC, a uh, partnership, a uh, sole prop? You know, many of those things are going to be very important to try and understand what's the best structure for your plan that you put together. Uh, number of owners obviously has a very big uh, uh, big key in that. If you have many owners or one, you know, or if it's a family, uh, you know, partners, those things, it's, you know, they, they all play factors into, uh, into how we would structure a plan. Uh, ages of owners are very important as well as, well as income. Uh, the number of employees, uh, the lesser amount of employees you have, sometimes there's greater opportunity with plans that allow you to defer uh, much higher maximums. Um, who's going to be making the contributions? Is it a profit sharing plan where the company is making them? Uh, or is it going to be a plan where it's mostly deferrals from, from the participants? Um, and also, what are the motivations of the owner? Is the motivation of the owner to put away money for themselves specifically? Uh, is it to retain key employees? Those things. So, those are all things that you want to uh, you want to consider when uh, when looking at what kind of plan that you're putting together. Uh, are are employees asking for a plan, or are there benefits to key employees that you want to retain? As mentioned, um, you know, it's sometimes an attractive feature in in recruitment for uh, for new employees that you're you're trying to to bring into your company. Uh, some uh, S-Corps especially, as we've seen a lot, because they have to take distributions or pay the business tax, um, you know, there's tax deduction opportunities that, uh, that can help you defer those things. Um, you can also look for benefits to the owners to the maximum and protecting assets from creditors as well because retirement assets uh, are um, bubbled and, uh, and, and covered from creditors in the event of bankruptcies and and, uh, and other things that the businesses sometimes face when they're having tough times. Types of plans that we're going to talk about today are, are kind of twofold. There's IRA plans, uh, which fall into the category of simplified employee pension plans, which are or other otherwise called SEPs, or simple plans, which are savings incentivized match plans for employees. Um, 
Also, we'll talk about ERISA plans, which are uh, a little bit more complex, but they offer uh, a, a lot more opportunity for deferrals and uh, vesting periods and those things as well. And what falls into that category are profit sharing plans, 401k plans, uh, solo Ks, and, and safe harbor K plans. The, uh, in a simple plan specifically, um, simples and steps can be established by sole proprietorships, LLCs, partnerships, and corporations. Um, they can be used by nonprofit organizations and government entities as well. However, an employee, employer with more than 100 employees earning at least $5,000 a year cannot establish a simple plan. There's no maximum employee levels for a SEP. Uh, and all businesses, business entities having common ownership under a control group will must establish uh, a plan together. So if you have a company that an owner has three different entities, you know, one is a trucking company, another is a, a uh, they have a convenience store outside the trucking company, and then they also have a mechanic shop uh, as well. There's different employees in all those different categories, and he has them under different business entities, but all under one umbrella. All employees of those different companies must be eligible for the same plan in combination. Uh, it's a common rule ownership for that. From an eligibility standpoint, one of the first questions an employer usually asks is, can I establish restrictions on who can participate in my plan? And the answer is yes, but there are some IRS restrictions. Uh, the most restrictive eligibility requirement for a simple plan allows an employer to require that the individual earns at least $5,000 in any prior two calendar years. So the plan will include part-time employees, uh, and there are no minimum age requirements. Um, for example, if an employee was hired in October of 05 and earned at least $5,000 by December 31st of that year, it would count as meeting one year of, for eligibility purposes. If they also earned over $5,000 for 2006, the employee would be eligible to participate on January 1st of 07. And also that employer must be less restrictive and allow employees to participate sooner in that regard. Um, if a business is brand new, it must allow all employees to participate immediately to begin the plan. And a, a SEP plan has a longer waiting period, though requiring at least three of the previous five calendar years. Uh, but they also may require employees to be at least 21 years of age and have to earn at least $550 during that year. Um, and that plan would also have to include part-time employees as well. An important feature to be aware of is vesting when you're talking about simple and SEP IRA plans. Um, all employees who are eligible for either a simple or a SEP plan must have 100% ownership um, or vesting in their account. That includes the employee salary deferrals, which is basically money that that employee is deferring on their own. And it also includes all employer contributions as well. So there is no schedule that if a person leaves after a year or two that they couldn't take their money with them immediately. Everything that they contribute plus what you contribute as an employer is 100% vested from day one. From an employer contribution standpoint, simple plans require an employer contribution, but they can elect to either make a matching contribution only for employees who participate by making salary deferrals or by making a non-elective contribution for all eligible employees. So the employer must provide annual notices on November 2nd of each year to disclose which employer contribution method will be used in the next year. And matching contributions can be reduced to as low as 1% two times a year in a five-year period that allows some flexibility. From a SEP plan, those contributions are discretionary. Uh, an employer can decide if they want to make contributions after the year is ended up till the date of filing for the business tax return, uh, including extensions. All, however, all eligible employees must receive the same percentage of compensation under a SEP plan. So if an employer is making $200,000 a year and defers 25%, which is $50,000, uh, he must also, or he or she, must also contribute for the employees up to that same percentage amount as well. So a person making uh, $40,000, uh, they would have to give basically a $10,000 participation amount into that employee's uh, SEP plan as well. Um, 
maximums for SEP plan contributions, as I mentioned, are 25 percent of compensation with an overall cap of $50,000 per account. Um, lastly, the maximum compensation that can be taken into account for a plan contribution uh, is $245,000. From an employee contribution standpoint, SEP plans don't allow participation from the employee. It is all employer-based and discretionary. Uh, simple IRA plans allow salary deferral similar to a 401k plan. Uh, in 2010, the maximum salary deferral was $11,500 a year. Uh, if an employee uh, is age 50 or older, there can be catch-up contributions permitted up to an additional $2,500. Um, actually, in, in now today, it's uh, over age 50, it's actually $3,000 and $12,500 from a voluntary standpoint. Um, these are scheduled to increase with cost of living adjustments in the future. Salary deferrals are income tax deferred, but not before FICA or Medicare taxes. Savers tax credits are also a very, an, another nice thing that, uh, that is uh, uh, helpful with these plans. Uh, the one new feature is the EGTRRA rules. Uh, it, it's the savers tax credit. Uh, taxpayer who is below the AGI limits can get a tax credit up to 50% of the first $2,000 deferred into a simple IRA plan. Uh, this is in, in addition to the tax deduction received. You actually do get to double dip uh, as shown in the, uh, in the slide. Withdraws. So, Although both of these plans are IRA plans, the rules are not the same. So in a simple IRA, distribution is subject to a 25% penalty if the withdrawal occurs in the first two tax years of plan participation if, they are, if a person is under 59 and a half, which is really a key age in all of retirement plans. This is in addition to paying ordinary tax income uh, and distributions uh, within the first two years are not eligible to roll to another plan of any type. Um, you can only transfer to another simple plan allowed. So basically, if you were an employer and you had a simple plan and you closed the simple plan in October of this year and for January 1 of the following year of 17, you were going to offer a 401k plan, uh, your employees and yourself would not be eligible to roll over any um, contributions that were made in the previous two years of the simple plan uh, to that 401k plan. Uh, that's kind of important sometimes because purchasing power of, for a new plan and how much assets are in it uh, is really important in terms of what kind of pricing you'll get uh, within a uh, 401k plan. Uh, SEP plans, they follow the traditional IRA feature and have a 10% penalty for premature distribution under age 59 and a half. And again, those distributions are also subject to ordinary taxation, uh, income taxation. So why are these uh, why are these plans attractive between simples and SEPs? Uh, there's no testing uh, a lot. You're you're basically avoiding these plans are attractive because they avoid all government testing, filing, and costs. They're, it makes the plans easy and economical for small employers. Uh, but they're also limiting as well. Uh, so you have very low ceilings or uh, in the case of a SEP IRA, uh, you potentially have to, to give very large amounts to your employer ba employee base uh, in order to try and maximize for yourself as, as an employer. Um, but again, they're easy to administer. Uh, they're low cost to administer from that standpoint. And, uh, uh, you know, there's very low plan administration fees and, and no IRS or Department of Labor reporting, which is sometimes very uh, appealing to a small business owner who is, you know, constantly having to file and, you know, different things, you know, working with their CPAs and whatnot. And, and sometimes that becomes quite cumbersome and, and people try to avoid that at all costs. So which plan is better? Um, let's go through an example and see which would be the best for, for a business. So we have Bill Gates Dental Shop. It's a sole prop, and they have six employees, and, and the owner wants a plan to maximize contributions for themselves, uh, including their spouse. Um, owners and spouse are 40 years old. Each have a net Schedule C income of $40,000, and there's four other employees that are earning $24,000 a year. In this example, the owners um, can contribute $12,700 each, 
uh, 11,500 as a salary deferral under, under a simple IRA plan, plus $1,016 as an employer matching contribution, which is 3% times the $40,000, which equals $12,000 or $1,200. Um, the owner plus the spouse can put away about $25,400 in that regard then. Maximum for the other employees would be to match 100% of the of their first 3% of the employee deferrals. Uh, that would cost $2,880 for all the employees matching contributions, which would be basically 24,000 times three, uh, which is $720 times four employees, which comes out to the $2,880. If we looked at this for an employer doing a SEP plan to receive the maximum amount of the 25% of compensation, they would also have to contribute 25% of compensation for all other eligible employees, which would be very obviously expensive for the employer, and it would not make it attractive in that regard to do something other than a simple plan for this. On another note, looking at another example, you have a flower shop that's an S-Corp. So from an S-Corp perspective, that person is either going to reinvest in their business they're gonna, or they're going to take distributions and pay taxes on them. Um, they have three employees. The owner's 30 and wants to maximize contributions. And he makes a pretty good sum of money at $360,000 uh, and paying himself uh, 265 on his W-2. Uh, and he's in a 35% tax bracket. And he has two employees that are making $30,000 a piece. Um, from that perspective, uh, Bob can contribute 25% of his W-2 income up to $53,000, uh, which is the lesser of 25% uh, of the two of $245,000. His cost co to contribute for the other eligible employees is $7,500 each. Uh, when we analyze it a little closer, what we find is that Bob's tax savings by making a contribution for himself assuming that he's in the 35% tax bracket, is $17,150. Um, it's more than the cost to make the SEP contribution for the other two employees. So what he says is, do I want to give up this money to my employees or to Uncle Sam? And what I normally find out in the, in, out in the, the market right now is people would, business owners would much rather pay their employees rather than paying a, uh, paying the, the government. They, you know, that 10 times out of 10 an employer is going to say, yeah, I would absolutely rather see my employee get that money rather than me paying it in taxes. That's interesting to note, Mike. I'm going to chime in here because in a way there's really, it's a win-win of sorts. You're really not losing or spending any money in that instance. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's really, it, it's, People are, uh, the employees work harder, they're happier, they're, they're more eager to go the extra mile for the employer. And, you know, the employer literally, I mean, it's, you know, who would you, who would you rather see go, your money go to if it's going to have to go one place or the other? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of nonsensical to, to not think, well, yeah, I'd rather give it to my employee, um, you know, rather than giving it to the government. It's, it's, it's really very much a win-win for both, uh, both people in that regard. So from the standpoint of how they work, simples or SEPs, um, basically employers make contributions to each employee's simple or SEP IRAs. Um, the employer must make contributions to all employees, even those who have terminated but were eligible to receive contributions before termination. Uh, and really it's kind of something we can gloss over a little bit that, uh, you know, if, if and when somebody would set something up like this, uh, you know, the, the finer points of that are, are covered by uh, the, the person, you know, such as the advisor who is administering the plan. So it's not something that really heavily has to be worried about other than, you know, getting things set up with your payroll. So fortunately, the IRS makes it convenient to set up these plans. Uh, they publish a form which acts as an adoption agreement. So simple plans use a form called a 5304 simple, and they can't be set up any later than October 1st of each year. So for those that are considering something for 2017, uh, you basically have, uh, today's the 20th, so like a week, 11 <laughs> days. Yeah, so basically, if you're looking to do something for this year, you're, you're under the gun a little bit for, for 2017. Um, 
from the uh, the simple plan uh, SEP forms, they use a 5305 SEP, and that also includes a notice that must go out to the employees. Um, each employee then opens up their IRA account under their name as either a simple IRA or a SEP IRA. So we had a chance to talk about simples and SEPs, which we saw, you know, have some opportunity there, um, but they're a little limiting in terms of your either your maximums, such as the simple plan, or uh, for whatever you do for yourself, you would have to do for your employees uh, in a SEP plan. Uh, we're going to switch over now. We're going to talk about ERISA plans. Uh, and in ERISA plans, basically what we have there are 401k plans with profit sharing. Uh, and 401k plans or profit sharing plans. And, and in some cases, you can combine these and, and do both, um, which, which really amplifies uh, opportunity there as well. Uh, as we'll see as we go through these, these plans are a little more uh, nuanced. They have more restrictions. There's more people that have to be involved. And they have a bit more administrative costs. Uh, but the opportunities that they provide are far greater, which allow vesting schedules, um, higher maximums, uh, just a bit more creativity uh, for for not only the business owner uh, but the employees as well, and uh, and we'll go through that and uh, we can we can see what uh, what things are. So from an eligibility standpoint, 401k plan specifically, uh, age 21 or older, 12 months of service with a thousand hours of service. So a thousand hours is an important uh, important notation for. Uh, 401k plans and profit sharing plans. Uh, basically, anything a thousand hours or more is considered full-time employment in in the ERISA world, and uh, that person must be made eligible with everybody else. Um, entry dates we can make those things daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually. Um, from a profit sharing standpoint, uh, same thing from the ages and months of service and hours of service. Um, entry dates though are either quarterly or semi-annual within those. From an employer contribution standpoint, in a standard K 401k plan, um, contributions can be discretionary. Uh, the maximum deduction is 25% of eligible compensation. Um, there's matching available, profit sharing, or both, really. Um, in a profit sharing plan, those contributions are discretionary, uh, dependent upon the profitability of the organization. The, the, there are, again, those maximum 25% deductions. and the total maximum for a profit sharing plan for somebody under age 50 uh, is $53,000. From a safe harbor 401k standpoint, and we'll talk about safe harbor in greater detail, um, safe harbor is basically a notation which allows a plan to avoid some of the heavier testing, um, but uh, it also provides some guarantees for participants, uh, the rank and file, not, not the ownership. Um, which gives them, uh, you know, better vesting, potentially other things, but it, it helps the, the owner to avoid uh, testing, uh, and, and we'll dig into that a little more. Um, those are mandatory contributions. There's either through a matching method, uh, which we normally see, and we'll go into a little greater detail in the following slides, um, or you can make additional discretionary contributions as well, up to a 25% maximum deduction. So from a matching method in uh, employer contribution safe harbors, they normally what we see is 100% of the first 3% of salary deferred plus 50% on the next two. Um, deferrals over 6% can't be matched, uh, and the additional matching limit is basically 4% of salary. Um, so rates of matching can't increase as deferrals percent increase. Uh, or the other way to do that to, to gain safe harbor status is non-elective method of 3% contributions for all eligible employees, meaning the person, the employee does not have to contribute in order to allow the, uh, in order to have contributions put in by the employee, or uh, employer, uh, the employee does not need to contribute for that. Uh, and that is also subject to a 25% maximum deduction as well. Uh, either one of these employer contribution methods for matching uh, or a non-elective method uh, would help a plan to gain safe harbor status. 
employee deferrals through, a, through the, the differences between profit sharing plans and 401ks. In a profit sharing plan, there are no employee deferrals. Profit sharing is entirely discretionary by the company or organization or the owner. Um, and, and really, they, if they basically solely decide whether at the end of the year is there money left over that we would like to, uh, to bonus out to the employees through the form of a profit sharing plan. In a K plan, uh, any employee deferral, 100% uh, of compensation or 18, up to $18,000 maximums uh, is allowed. Uh, additionally, you can contribute, if you're age 50 or older, $6,000 in catch-up contributions as well. Um, in a standard K plan, highly compensated, and this goes back to why, why are uh, why are safe harbor plans uh, attractive or why does a company want to gain a safe harbor status for their plan? Uh, highly compensated employees are subject to ADP, ACP, uh, and top-heavy testings. Basically, what's, uh, what happens is in the event that a plan is top-heavy where you would have 60% uh, or higher of, uh, of the highly compensated uh, deferrals in a plan above and beyond the lower rank and file employees, uh, that plan would fail top heavy testing and those things. And so what happens with safe harbor status is those plans are not tested for that. So it allows uh, the highly compensated or ownership to defer their maximums uh, without possibly having restrictive distributions coming back out of the plan, uh, which would then force them to take money and then have to obviously pay taxes on it. Uh, as they weren't able to keep it in there because they failed testing. So some new features in uh, in the 401k plan sphere over the last couple of years. Uh, auto enrollment, which I try to normally uh, have all of my plans that I administer uh, take advantage of. Uh, minimums of 3% uh, with an increasing annually up to 6%. It forces an employee to opt out. So basically what I normally have is uh, every year, anybody that's not participating in a plan, uh, I try to, to talk the ownership into basically saying, you know, force everybody back into the plan uh, that they're participating, but and they have to call and or go online uh, to opt back out of the plan. And, and what you're really trying to do is get, get people to take savings seriously. Um, you know, if you don't, people are going to continue to kick the can down the road and worry about the five minutes in front of their face. Um, whereas you're, you're, you're really trying to, um, you know, engage your employees and, and have them become responsible and, you know, responsible for the retirement uh, because at the end of the day, we don't know how much longer Social Security is going to be there, how much is it going to pay out, and, and it's, it's not replacing uh, enough of people's income in retirement to, to only focus on Social Security. Uh, so empowering your people uh, to, to, to focus on retirement, be responsible for that. Uh, that's a way to help push that along. Um, through QDIA, Qualified Default Investment Arrangements, uh, it allows diversified investment options for auto-enrolled participants. Uh, basically, that, what that's kind of saying is a lot uh, that focuses on target date funds specifically uh, that invest an employee into a fund that is uh, appropriate for their age, that continues to evolve over time, as they get older, uh, that fund also adjusts and becomes more conservative or focuses uh, to invest at, at an average, for a person's average age. So a, a person that's invested at age 25 in a target date fund has a much longer time horizon than a person that's 60. And that person that is 25, um, their investments would normally be much more aggressive and going for higher growth and return than a person who's 60 who should be more focused on preservation of wealth um, and less volatility. And that, those things, uh, the qualified default investment arrangements, they also provide the employer with a good layer of fiduciary protection, which is very important in regards when you're offering a, uh, an ERISA-based plan uh, because there is a fiduciary responsibility to the employer uh, to do what is right for the participants. This next slide is going to go over discrimination testing. Uh, I don't I don't want to dig too deep into it because it's a bit more detailed than people need to see, but as the slide will be here for those that look at the, uh, at the presentation after the fact, um, basically it can show you a little bit more of how, how testing is performed and what, uh, what fails or passes testing. And Again, safe harbor plans avoid that test. Um, standard ADP tests, 
uh, as well. Safe harbor plans avoid that as well. And we'll just run through this real quick. Um, it's just not something that you guys need much detail on right now. Um, but just know that if you're in safe harbor status, do you avoid that testing as well? as well as standard top-heavy testing, even though I'll jump into this a little more. So a plan, as I mentioned before, it's top-heavy when 60% or more of the accrued benefits are for the key employees. Uh, and the definitions of those key employees are someone who is more than 5% owner, an officer earning more than 170,000, uh, or 1% or more owner earning more than 150. And uh, triggers that are mandated uh, employer contributions are based on contributed. Uh, again, safe harbor a status allows that testing to be avoided. From a vesting standpoint, as we spoke about vesting before, um, the nice thing with ERISA-based plans is you can set up schedules uh, for vesting. Um, standard 401k plans can either use a three-year cliff vesting schedule or a six-year graduated vesting schedule whereby the employer earns full vesting after six years. Uh, I already mentioned the vesting schedule for the mandatory contributions of a safe harbor plan, uh, which are really uh, a lot more shorter and or uh, giving an employee immediate, uh, immediate vesting from day one in order to gain that safe harbor status. Uh, the other attractive features here are that additional discretionary contributions uh, can be subject to a vesting schedule as well. From the annual addition limit, this is another test that we need to be aware of. It's called the annual additions limit. Uh, it's a limit on the total that can be added to any individual's participating count in a 401k plan. Uh, the limit is the sum of three component, components, the employee's contribution, the employer's match or discretionary contribution, and any forfeitures that may be reallocated to an account. Uh, forfeitures are funds that are shared among the participants and come from a non-vested uh, portion of a, a terminated employee's account. Um, when an employee leaves the company, they only get to take the vested part of their employee or contribution. Uh, the remainder is forfeited and reallocated among the remaining participants, which for the remaining participants is kind of nice. Um, you know, for the person that left, uh, they, you know, oh, well, so sad, but, uh, you know, that, that's also part of why the vesting schedules are there. Um, so an additional limit on the total cannot exceed 100% of any employee's compensation or $49,000, which, whichever is less. Withdraws. A lot of uh, employees ask, employers ask about potential withdraws. Um, and normally what we try and, there's, there's certain things that you can use from a withdrawal perspective. It's intent, a 401k is obviously intended to be a savings vehicle uh, to set aside funds for retirement. So it's designed to make money readily available until then, not designed not to make money readily available till then. And, and basically everybody has to leave the company in order to get their money. The separation from service includes termination of employment, retirement, disability, or due to death. Uh, but a plan may allow for hardship withdrawals, withdrawals or in-service withdrawals for participants who are over age 59 and a half and 100% vested. When a participant receives a distribution, it will be taxable as ordinary income and can be subject to an additional 10% penalty if they are under 55 years old. Um, so the distribution options on that are you, leave, you can leave it in an old plan if you leave the employer. So not everybody, if you leave your 401k plan, not a, you don't have to roll it to your new plan. You can leave it in a current plan. Um, you can direct roll it over into a, your new employer's plan. Uh, or you can direct roll it over into an IRA uh, under with an advisor or with E-Trade or Mer Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, Charles Schwab. Uh, if you take a distribution, they're subject to ordinary income taxes, and if you're under 55 years old, there is a 10% penalty as well. Fiduciary responsibilities. This is very important from the employer perspective, so pay attention. So a fiduciary is any person who exercises discretionary authority or control over the administration of investments in an ERISA plan, such as profit sharing, pension, or 401k. Uh, a plan sponsor or the empl employer, trustee, or any party in interest to those entities are all considered to be fiduciaries, and you need to act in the best interest of a participants of the plan. So. An employer that sponsors a 401k plan is the fiduciary. Therefore, the responsibilities, they, there are responsibilities they need to be made aware of. That's where somebody like myself 
a third party administrator, the record keeper, uh, they come in. Uh, first is the prudent plan rule, which basically says that you must exercise the same care, skill, prudence, and diligence as a prudent person in similar circumstances. Secondly, you have to work to offer adequate asset classes in order to diversify a plan investment to minimize the risk of large losses. Lastly, uh, the, the plan must be bonded under the amount of 10% of funds to handle up to a $500,000 maximum bond. And steps that help reduce fiduciary liability, have an investment policy statement. That's very important. Uh, and when you work with an advisor such as myself, along with a TPA and uh, and a record keeper, you know, such as uh, there's numerous, you know, there's 10, 20, 30, 40 of them out there. There's the, the Voyas and Powers uh, principal um, yeah, American funds. There's there's a ton of them out there. Um, choose a plan investment uh, the alternatives and monitor them on an ongoing basis. Um, explain the provisions as well as the investment options to the participant. Educate the employees about the retirement plan and investing and keep detailed records of all those above actions. And as mentioned, uh, that's, that's where your advisor comes into place and helps with those things on, a, on an ongoing basis. From a plan administration standpoint, plan administration involves the accounting, testing, and reporting functions of maintaining the plan in compliance with IRS and Department of Labor rules and regulations. Uh, it's best to delegate these responsibilities to somebody who stays on top of them and in charge of them. Um, there's a cost for plan administration, as I mentioned when we started in the ERISA uh, section with 401ks and profit sharing. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, there, there's tax credits for those costs. Uh, they can be tax deductible to the business, but uh, with a little bit greater cost also comes a little bit greater opportunity as well. As we saw, there's higher maximums, uh, more opportunity for uh, for different um, uh, different vehicles, uh, 401k in conjunction with profit sharing, those kind of things. And it just allows a, a much broader opportunity for the employer uh, as well as employees as well. So there's a bit more opportunity to be more creative than previously. From a plan establishment standpoint, uh, you would basically look at the, the things typically December 31st, uh, last day of the fiscal year, uh, must be established by. Uh, there's a payroll integration that needs to, to occur in order to do ongoing, uh, ongoing um, contributions from payroll. Uh, and then there's also enrollment meetings that have to happen, which an advisor and the record keeper would sit down with those employees to go over, to go over investment elections and, and those kind of things. From a safe harbor standpoint, uh, plans have much different rules for establishing a plan. Uh, you can see those there. A uh, company with no plan has to start a new plan three months prior to the new year. Um, an existing plan, profit sharing plan can convert. There must be three months left in the year. Uh, and an existing 401k has to wait to amend their plan till the new year. So which plan is right for you? Uh, as you can see on those things, profit sharing plans, um, you normally are great for family-involved businesses, high-income owners, uh, people that have a desire to profit, bonus uh, employees uh, that want to use vesting for employees or there need to be flexible contributions. Uh, K plans, uh, that's where you want employees to buy in by participating. Uh, there's They want minimum contribution commitments and uh, a workforce is usually knowledgeable about investments uh, and the company needs to have the flexibility for contributions and in some cases, they want to avoid testing through safe harbor status. Um, things to remember, obviously, uh, you have to consider these things about a solo K. It's a totally flexible plan that you can decide to contribute 0% uh, to the maximum allowed. Uh, it can be used to combine other retirement plan savings you, you have. Uh, and the plan may per permit loans to you um, as a solo K. Uh, but there are rules you need to have to uh, to avoid from having the loan distribution become prohibited a transaction and, and thus a taxable event. Um, so from that standpoint, when looking at solo Ks, if you're a sole proprietor uh, and do want large uh, large abilities to, to defer, um, you know, there are some nuances that you do want to make yourself aware of and should speak with an advisor about. So from a conclusion standpoint, small businesses obviously, you want cost-effective plans. Um, there's just many different options available and really what makes the most sense is sitting down with somebody such as myself or an advisor who focuses on these areas to help understand and put something together that is right based on what your needs are. 
Um, so again, I appreciate everybody's time. I hope people find this, uh, this lecture and uh, presentation to be a great resource that they refer back to uh, when they consider taking a look at things to either amend a plan, start a plan, uh, or find something that, that maybe fits them a bit better. So Suzanne, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Not at all, Mike. And I just wanted to say it is very complex. And I know a lot of our small business owners are so tied up in just running their business. It's heavy duty stuff. So um, I'm figuring you're telling them go to someone who understands it uh, wherever they are in the state and then get that uh, professional advice from what, an investment advisor or is there a name for the person who does know about well, small business so there, savings plans? There's a lot, there's a lot of, so, so I myself as an investment consultant, uh, I, I do individual investments, um, you know, I do uh, uh, 529 savings plans for kids for college. I do rollover. It, it's but specifically, I have I have from my previous jobs picked up some knowledge that that has caused me to have a desire to focus in the area of uh, structured retire structuring retirement plan vehicles uh, for businesses a, a little bit more than than others. Uh, there's okay. many advisors that that don't really want to focus on that area, either even though mm -hmm. they're licensed fully to do it. Um, so what I would ask if you're going to meet with somebody, uh, you know, is this something that you focus specifically on or, or is it something that, hey, well, because we're golfing buddies that we, you know, you, you'd be willing to do it? Because I think you probably want one that has a bit more of a focused knowledge that, that is working in this area and arena in, in a bit more of, a, of an ongoing basis because there are nuances to it and, and constantly evolving rules and regulations that just... That are changing. Yeah, but it sounds to me, just in summary, that small businesses can do this, can attract employees, can help themselves save money for retirement. They don't have to spend too much money, and times have changed that it is really viable for a smaller business. Am I right about that? Absolutely, 100%. All right, well, listen, I want to thank you so very much. And if anyone has any questions at all, I am going, I've been recording this. I am going to post it on our website in the next day or two. I'll also be putting it in the upcoming newsletter. We had a number of people who couldn't get on who wanted to watch. I'll be mailing it to them. And, of course, you might want to review the slides so you'll have access to it. So thank you all so much. Thanks very much, Mike. And everyone have a lovely day. Look forward to our next webinar, which will be about data security on the third Tuesday of, uh, of October. And we'll be sending out information about that. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.